Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Survival means the continuance of life. Life is, she says, not even a, a value. It is that which you have to have in order for there to be values. So she's got this you know, contrast of could a robot actually value anything? No, because there's nothing that it, it stands to lose. It's not actually alive. Living things can, can value other things. Um, and she says, value is, is that which one acts to gain or keep. It's not primary. It presupposes an answer to um, certain other questions. So from life, we get to values. And we can, she, she speaks of a hierarchy of values in different places. What, what's a hierarchy? When you have a hierarchy, yeah. Like levels of importance? Exactly. So you can set up, you know, like, um, if I were to ask you, so here's a chocolate that I took from the department office. And I really like this kind of chocolate because it's, it's dark chocolate. No, it's milk chocolate. Actually, I'm not as big on milk chocolate as dark chocolate. Um, which is more important, this or this? Should I, should, you know, somebody comes up to me, Dr. Sandler, I'll give you two of these. If you gave me this, I'd be an idiot, right? There's a hierarchy there in place. How many, how many iPhones would, say, replace a good friendship? I don't know. If you have to ask that question, you're probably not really that close of a friend with the person anyway, are you? Because friendship, a genuine friendship, would be at a higher level. You, you can set up a hierarchy of your, your values. And every one of you has a number of values. But those values ultimately have to, for, for Rand's purposes, um, serve life, serve you staying alive. And survival is a key part of that. Survival, echo. I often misspell words, I have to check them. Um, is survival all that we, we, we have to focus on now? Uh, they're staying alive, and that's, that's good. If you don't stay alive, the whole question of values is a moot point. What else, yeah? Satisfying the basic needs. Yeah, and a lot of that has to do with, with survival. So I gotta eat, I have to have water, I need shelter. Yeah. Happiness? Yeah, now she's gonna frame happiness in terms of emotions and talk about that a little bit later on. But the way in which she's going to understand this has to do with living a fully rational human life. I have a soundtrack in the background from now. Um, not making me happy. Uh, living a rational human life, actually exploring and developing the potential that we have. What are, what are things that are distinctively human that we do that the other animals aren't able to do? They don't, yeah. Reason? There, there's a big one, yeah. I'm trying to sort of unpack what goes into reason though. Um, it's, but reasoning, thinking about things. Um, I mean, dogs think a little bit, and cats think a little bit, but not like... Like a conscious? Conscience? Oh, like a moral conscience? Like yeah. uh, distinguishing right and wrong? Yeah, we have... I'll, I'll, I'll get to your ears in a second. We have a conception of, of, you know, moral right and wrong. A dog has a conception of, I, I shouldn't do this because I get smacked in the, the nose when I do, and I should do this because I get a cookie when, when I do <laughs> this. We go way beyond that, right? So that that's, that's a good... Um, choosing between alternatives. Yes. Another thing that animals kind of do, I mean, insects don't really choose at all. They're lower animals. As we get higher and higher and closer to us, 
there seems to be something more like choice, but it's not, it's not like the dog ever sits down and makes a T-chart and says, cause trouble, don't cause trouble. What are the, what are the benefits, what are the payoffs? We do things like that, right? And, and we also talk with each other. We consult each other. What do you think about this? Yeah, it's not a bad idea. No, you shouldn't do that because of this. Um, we have you know, a lot of capabilities that go far beyond our merely animal nature. And they come out of, for Rand, our, our animal nature, but they're the kind of animal that we are. So there are some distinctively human um, aspects to a full life. And part of that includes choosing to think, she says. And thinking is, in fact, as she says, volitional. It means it involves the will, it involves commitment. She seems to talk as if most people don't think most of the time, that they're sort of floating around, you know, taking their values from wherever they get them. But really what she, she's advocating is that we want to think out what our values should be, what is going to serve life, what is going to get us on the way to a distinctively human life, enjoying it, having happiness, and then choose those and arrange the things in order. So. For example, social approval, you know, most of us want other people to, to like us, to approve of us. Very few people don't. Some people really don't and they enjoy making other people angry and irritated, but they're the minority. If social approval matters to you, it's a value, right? Are there other things that should take precedence over that if you want to live a rational or even if you just want to survive. In the society that we live in, social approval is probably not going to get you killed. Um, but it, you know, it could lead you to some problems. Drinking too much is not good for you, right? You might drink too much because you want to hang out with people and be, you know, be in the, the group and uh, be considered a fun person. That's probably not going to kill you at all. Uh, but it will you know, diminish life. Um, but are there a lot of things where you have to you know, trade off a rational life? Think about getting your ideas from whatever it is society gives you, as opposed to thinking them out for yourself and choosing what you want to value instead of just having other people give you what you should value. That's, you know, there's a valuation going on there. One is supposed to be higher than the other. You have to choose one or the other for any of these sort of things. So, you know, she talks about a bunch of different, um, she leads us from, you know, the, the bacteria all the way up to human beings, you know, having goals, um, life, nature, you know. And what she's really interested in is life is an ultimate value, the goal or the end to which all of their lesser goals are the means. This should set the standard for all of this stuff. Over here is where we do our... Moral decisions, actions. These can become habits for us. This is where we make our choices. This is where we live our life. Over here is the you know the standard. If something is going to improve my life, then it's good for me. If something improves lives for human beings in general. It's good for human beings in general, would be how this would go. Do you see how this sort of approach can get you out of the, the problem with egoism, where it would be, well, look, you've got this set of you know, de desires and, and um, priorities and, and uh, preferences, and I've got this set, and they don't really match up. There is no good overall. The good overall is life and what conduces to life, what will lead us to a, a fuller life. So by contrast, anything that gets in the way of that is going to be what? Anti-life and therefore? Irrational. Irrational and therefore bad, morally bad. Bad for us, bad to do, bad to encourage others to do. Um, so she says, you know, life is the only phenomenon that's an end in itself. The concept of value is dependent on and derived from the concept of life. To speak of value as apart from life is worse than a contradiction in terms. She's very given to hyperbole. 
Uh, it is only the concept of life that makes the concept of value possible. So now some people would say there's certain values that should take precedence over life itself. There's some things that, that you ought to sacrifice yourself to. That's part of what she's trying to, to criticize and attack. So, you know, um, she's, a, she's a big critic of religion, for example. Some people think of religion this way. I'm not going to say that, that um, anybody here necessarily does, because this is kind of a reductive way of looking at it. But a value for you could be getting in good with God, being on God's good side, not getting on God's bad side. You know, when you picture God as like the big guy in the sky with the lightning bolts, that's actually Zeus, that's not really, you know, the Old Testament or New Testament God, but, but uh, it's close enough. And if you picture, you know, life that way, then the, the top value would be being on God's good side, and you'd figure that out through, you know, some sort of religious authority, and maybe you should sacrifice your life to that or your rationality to that. Rand would say, well, that's putting the cart before the horse. Values are supposed to serve life, not life values. Um, and you, could, you could do the same thing for other values as well. She's very critical of hedonism, the uh, moral theories that say that we should pursue pleasure. Because pleasure is a value. Anybody here who doesn't like pleasure, doesn't like enjoying things, have too much enjoyment in your life, too much uh, satisfaction? Probably not, right? Could you could you all use a little bit more pleasure in your day? If I had like candy to give all of you that you know improve your day. Well, the pleasure is a value, but do you want to subordinate life to just the pursuit of pleasure? That would be living a kind of inhuman existence. You would not be developing what's distinctively human in that case. And to say that that's the, the way to go, then that would be a mistake. Now, she gives you some criteria for figuring out what actually is of value. She says um, pleasure and pain form a part of that, you know, at a, at a basic physical level and also to a certain degree psychological level. So if I do something dumb, like uh, I'm trying to look around, this is a very safe classroom. Uh, I'll just have to make up an example. So there's like, you know, pin, there's, there's some pins in the, the, the cork board over there. Let's say I poke a pin into my, my uh, thumb. Uh, not just my hand and the thumb, where the bone is. That hurts, right? You've all done stuff like that at one point or another. When I was a kid, I actually took a, my mom's car keys and stuck them into the uh, electrical socket. Only do that once, right? Because <laughs> it knocked me backwards. Everything turned blue for a while. Like the key got really hot, my mom got really uh, worried and then very mad. I learned that's a bad idea. Don't do that sort of thing. And in general, things that are going to screw up your life tend to hurt, right? If you think of all the things that you enjoy drinking, and now think of things that would be bad for you to drink, like, um, I don't know, hydrogen peroxide. That would, it probably wouldn't kill you. I don't think it's poisonous, but it can't be good for you, right? My, my grandparents, when they were kids, they used to gargle with kerosene. If you had a cold, that was the, that was the, the cure for it, gargle with kerosene. And they said it tasted awful, but not as bad as gasoline. So that means that they also tasted <laughs> gasoline. <laughs> you know? Um, now, there's lots of things that we do. You know? How do we know that you shouldn't bend your finger you know, further back than this? Because it hurts after a while. Um, how do you know that you should eat a certain amount each day? Because you're going to get hungry and that's going to hurt, right? How do you know that you shouldn't eat too much? Well, your stomach gets super full and then, you know, you, that hurts too. Or you lay around and you can't get anything done. This is very simple stuff, right? Um, and how do we know what's good for us? Generally, and there's some traps with this, right? Like, say, heroin. Um, generally, they're pleasant. Heroin's not good for us, we know, but it's intensely pleasant. But most things that are good for us are pleasant. Um, most things that taste good. Um, at least, you know, if we're relying on very simple food, are actually good for us. Most things that actually taste quite bad are probably not good for us to eat. We've kind of screwed that up with, you know, how we put fat and sugar and salt into everything, but um, you get the general idea. So she says this pleasure pain mechanism um, serves as a, a sort of guardian of the organism's life. And then beyond that, you have consciousness as a means of survival. We start thinking out, what do I need? And eventually we get to the point of distinctively rational human thought, and you realize that you need, for example, shelter. 
Well, you're going to have to build a shelter, so you better use your head to figure out what's going to work for that. Can, can you use anything whatsoever to build a shelter? Well, your guy said, you know, it's now Survivor, we're on the island. You guys still remember that show? Yeah. Um, this is our raw material, these desks. And we'll start, you know, sending the water down from the sky to the ceiling in a couple minutes. Could you make a good shelter out of these desks? Probably not. Probably be smarter to figure out, you know, who's got jackets and stuff like that, and we'd put those over it. You do a little bit of thinking, right? This will be like our, our roof. It won't keep the rain out, but it'll at least keep most of it off of us. Um, well, that's, again, serving life. And that is something that requires effort to do. Not everybody necessarily does that. Animals do what they do by instinct. We have reason, and we have to choose to actually use reason. So, you know, like she says, an animal has no choice in the standard of value directing its actions. Its sense is provided with an automatic code of values. We're different. We don't have an automatic code of values. Because of our more complicated nature, we're sort of like what she calls a tabula rasa, blank slate. <coughs> um, we have to make, which says man has no automatic code of survival, he has no automatic course of action, no automatic set of values. Um, his own consciousness has to discover the answers to all these questions, but his consciousness will not function automatically. We have to choose to think. And that is the basis, at least as far as life and values go, of Ayn Rand's ethical you know, theory, which is rational egoism. 